partnered in that today. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to the foundation of what this particular part of our sermon series deals with, and that is 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 15. I've been using this verse for the cornerstone for this particular message. Uh, this will be the second time that we have looked at this, and I want us to think about the subject today. We are in a new series that's entitled Life Path. And Life Path deals with the changing seasons of our life. Life is not always the same. And one of the most difficult things that we have to deal with in life is change. Really nothing about change appeals to us. None of us really like change, but it's a part of life. And many times it becomes a big deal. And we have to make major adjustments in our life when these changes come. When I started this particular series, The Changing Seasons of Life, we dealt with a sermon that sort of like laid the foundation to the Word to follow all of the changing elements of our life, the different periods of time that we find ourselves in that in many cases doesn't bring us joy, doesn't bring us happiness. Now we do know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we can find ways to be happy even in the down times of our life. We can. Sometimes it takes quite a bit of effort to do that. But I want to look at this series today and remind you a little bit about what we have been talking about in the changing seasons of life. We dealt with the season of temptation and how we have to navigate through that at times. We talked about the season of failure. Whenever we get to the places in life where we feel like we've really dropped the ball, we've really messed up, we've really made a mistake, we've really got far away from the Lord, those particular times of failure, I remember that sermon well. Now this morning we're going to go into part two of the season of depression. What does the Bible say about that? We're talking about winning the battle of depression from a bi biblical perspective. And I want us to talk about that, to see what God's Word has for us on this subject. Now, last Sunday we had a celebration, and so we took a Sunday off from the series, but today we get right back in it. And so this morning, I, I want us to examine, to re-examine the lives of some characters in the Bible who found themselves in such an upheaval with depression. I'm going to speak about primarily three, but there were others in the Bible that dealt with it as well. If you remember the prophet Jeremiah, maybe you're not familiar with his ministry, but Jeremiah was a prophet of God who never saw one convert. And in one part of his ministry, he said this in such despair and despondency. He said, I will never speak his name again. Now you think about that. Now if you take time to read Jeremiah sometimes, you'll find it's a little complicated, but you can read it. You can be blessed without a preacher. You can be blessed without a teacher. You can read portions of Jeremiah and be inspired as well. But I will tell you, that was one primary character of the Scriptures who found himself very depressed at times. This morning, I want to focus on the three where we left off last week or the week before. I want to talk about Moses. I want to talk about Elijah, and I want to talk about the prophet Jonah. All three of these great men of God found themselves in a place of life where they were totally dysfunctional and depressed. Now, if you're watching from home today, we again, we thank you for tuning in. And we're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 15 in just a moment. And I've got several scriptures for you. I hope you have your Bibles at home, and I hope that you'll follow along with us. This morning, I'm not going to be preaching from an evangelistic perspective. I want to take my time. This is more of a preaching slash teaching type of a sermon. I think the subject matter is so delicate that I want to go very slow and very cautiously with it. And so I hope that you'll stay with me. Stay tuned in. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 15. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for the opportunity that you've set before us today to be in your house. 
And Lord, I look out across the congregation. There are many here today. I know there are many that are not able to be here today. Some are not ready to be here today. But I thank you for this day. It's the day that you have made. And I pray, God, that your word would go forth in such a way that it would build us up in the faith. It would encourage us. It would edify us. I pray that if there is anyone watching today that does not know you as their personal Savior, that they would trust you. Oh, God, may they give their hearts to you today. And as always, oh, Lord, help us not to traffic in the errors of untruth. And we will thank you and praise you for all that you do and all God's people said. Amen. Now, I want you to look with me at this passage of Scripture. I'm not going to give you the background. I've done it for two, two Sundays already. But I just want to read the verse of Scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 15. The Bible says, And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And as I think about the scripture today, I want you to turn with me right away to an Old Testament passage as well. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 13. I want you to see something here. This is a very precious verse. I think it would be meaningful to you to put it in the margin of your Bible as we study uh, the word this morning, maybe even besides Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 15. But we're talking about three different people here today. Moses, Elijah, and Jonah. Moses found himself embedded in a period of depression because of the multitude of people that he was dealing with. Multitudes of people that had various complaints and murmurings and demanded so much out of him. And in one instance, <clears throat> you know the word of God, where the Bible said God had spoken to Moses and told him to speak to the rock. And Moses, in frustration, struck the rock. Now, as a consequence to that, you know what the alternative was to that. God did not permit him to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. As he was dealing with these very emotional problems, the stress of the people, look at this passage of Scripture. The Bible says this, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. I made this statement just a few Sundays ago that a broken spirit is just as hurtful and painful as a broken bone. We're studying some of the things that made Moses and Elijah and Jonah get to a place in their life where they were just not having a bad day. But they were actually asking God, take my life. Now, those guys were really on rock bottom when they got to this place. Some things that had caused these great men, these great champions of the faith to be depressed. Again, Moses was so burned out for dealing with all of these people. Now I want us to notice a little bit about Elijah's feeling. We're going to come back to Moses in just a moment. But I want to talk a little bit about the feelings that Elijah had. When things were going south for him, he also had a very serious emotional problem. And I will say this, I, I would classify Elijah's problem as sort of like he was in what we call from time to time, he was having himself a real big pity party. And let me say this about that. It's easy to have a pity party but it's difficult to get out of one. And I think we all can identify with that. That's exactly where Elijah was at this place. I want to show you something, how this happened to him. And maybe you can identify with some of these scriptures this morning that shines a light maybe perhaps on your situation and you can glean from God's word how this can give you strength to face the challenges that you experience. 
Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 4. And they will get these scriptures on the screen for you in an orderly fashion. But I want you to see this. This is a very important passage of scripture. And I want you to see how Elijah, the great prophet of God, the one who had called down fire from heaven, the one who had defied the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, I want you to notice something very carefully about this scripture because it has the key to Elijah's depression. The word says this, talking about Elijah now, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself. Now, this is imperative. This is important. If you take notes and you're accustomed to writing in your Bible, I would encourage you to underline those words. They may seem to be insignificant as you see it on the screen or as you read it in your lap, but I promise you it holds the key to his depression. If you look at this passage, he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I, look at this very carefully, for I am not better than my father's. Underline that. He requested for himself, because you can easily see here, as he's requesting for himself, that he has, for these reasons... He has taken his eyes off of the Lord. Do you remember when Simon Peter was out in the boat and uh, the storm was raging and he saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, bid me to come. I want to step out. I want to walk on the water. Lord, bid me to come. Jesus said, come on. And the word of God says he stepped out of the boat. He began to walk on the water. He was going to Jesus. But immediately the Bible says when he put his eyes on the storm, when he put his eyes on the sea, the word says he immediately began to sink down into the water and he cried out, Lord, save me. Everything was going good as long as he had his eyes on Jesus. The moment he took his eyes off of Jesus, that's where the problem started. And I will tell you this, life is a battle for us too. Life is like an ocean sometimes for us. And life will be good if we keep our eyes on the Lord. You say, well, preacher, that's not necessarily true. I have all kinds of issues in my life. Yes, you will. But try to imagine going through those things without him. Mylon Lefevre wrote a song a long time ago that says, without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I would surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. And that's so true. Look at these words here. He requested for himself. And here's the key. Elijah was not praying at this point after great victories because he had prayed, God, I need your power. We're going to defeat the prophets of Baal. God, I want you to show the world today that you are sovereign. You are the only God. And so, God, I'm praying that you will do these wonderful things for your honor and glory. Now, there was a period of time on Mount Carmel where Elijah was praying in the will of God. He was praying for the power of God. But in this particular situation that Elijah found himself in under the juniper tree, he was not praying for God's will to be done. He wasn't praying for God to manifest his glory. He wasn't praying for God to have his will and for God to have his way. Now Elijah is sitting under the juniper tree and now he's not requesting or he's not praying for divine intervention. He's not praying for God to do these incredible things. He's requesting something, listen now, not for God's glory, but for his benefit. And the Bible says here, if you look at the latter part of this, he, he requested for himself. And look at that very carefully because you've got to focus on this. He said this, and I underlined this this morning. This is imperative. Listen, he said, for I am not better than my father's. Now, what do you see there? Elijah gets to this despondent place in life, and he sits under the juniper tree, and he's very depressed. And we have to remember why. We'll get to that in just a moment. And he's folding his arms and he's depressed and he's despondent. And he's not praying, Lord, thy will be done. God, do something great, manifest your glory. The Bible says this, that he is now requesting something 
for himself. He has taken his eyes off of the power of God, off of the will of God, off of the things that God would have him to do. And now he's sitting down, he's requesting for himself. He's saying, oh God, I've had enough. I'm requesting that you just kill me. I just want to die right now. And the reason, he says, for I am not any better than my father's. Now I want you to think about this. How did Elijah get to this place right here after such a mighty victory on Mount Carmel? I'm not any better than my father's. Well, apparently, somewhere between Mount Carmel and this juniper tree, he thought that he was. Think through that just for a moment. He was saying this, Lord, I don't deserve this. I, I'm Elijah. I'm, I'm the great prophet. Have you not forgot, Lord? Have you not remembered, rather, have you not remembered what just happened on Mount Carmel? I'm the great man. I'm the great prophet. I don't deserve this. I, I, don't, I don't deserve going through this. No one else is out here doing what I'm doing, God, and I cannot believe you're doing this to me. God, this is not fair. For I'm not any better than my father's. Well, you have to look at this because at some point in that passage, he's equating himself to not being any better than his father. So at some point he thought that he was. And the point that I want to make is this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. And this will help you. If you get down and you get despondent and you say, Lord, I'm teaching that Sunday school class. I'm doing that children's church work. I'm doing that singing. I'm doing the playing. I'm doing all of the church cleaning. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And Lord, it's not fair that I would have all of these unbalanced things in my life, things that are just going hay haywire. Lord, it's not fair. It's not right. Well, listen, if you ever get to the place where you feel like God's picking on you and God's singling you out and, and God's allowing unfair things to come into your life and he ought not to be doing it to you, it's okay, God, if you do it to him because I can understand why. I can understand why she would be going through that. But Lord, why me? Well, here's the key. If you ever get to a place where you begin to put yourself on a pedestal, and you feel that God is just being totally unfair to you. He singled you out. Look at this verse of scripture. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Somewhere along the line, Elijah began to think, hey, I, I'm better than that. But then he got to the place where he said, I'm not any better than them. I'm not any better than my father's. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse number three. They'll get the scripture up for you quick. Romans chapter 12, verse number three. Paul said this, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. Look at this, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So listen carefully. There are many times we're going to feel down and unappreciated. We're going to feel used. We're going to feel like maybe perhaps that we're being taken advantage of. But it's critical that when those kind of emotions start to come over us, that we've got to resort back to the word of God. We've got to resort back to prayer and wise counsel in those times of desperations. Now, let me show you something very important here. The reason why Elijah was sitting under the juniper tree having the pity party to begin with it's because Jezebel had just put a bounty on his head. You have to remember up on Mount Carmel, he had defeated all of the prophets of Baal. And as a result of that, he was really making a mockery out of her God, out of her religion, out of her belief system, and so forth. And so when the fire from heaven came down and consumed them, she instantly got insanely mad and outrageous with him and put a bounty on his head. And as a result of that, now listen, he was just the man who had called down fire from heaven. He had a great relationship with God. He had a personal relationship with him. God had done exactly what God wanted to do. God had done what Elijah had prayed for. Yet when Jezebel got furious with all of that 
and said, listen, he needs to die. We're going to execute him for this. When Elijah got word of that, that's when he began to run into the wilderness. He did not say, hey, uh, listen, God's greater than you. God sent me on this mission. If you want to get mad at somebody, you get mad at God. That's not what he did. As soon as he heard that these things were going to happen, the Bible says he began to run into the wilderness and he began to have himself a pity party. And here's what I noticed. When I studied this scripture, you think with me now, as Elijah is running from Mount Carmel, think about that. The great prophet of God who had just won this great victory, he's turning and he's running with his shirt tail in the wind. He has heard that Jezebel has got a bounty on his head and now he runs to the wilderness. He sits down under the juniper tree. He begins to have himself a pity party. He said, God, it's not fair. I'm not any better than my father's. It's not worth it. I've had enough. Just kill me. Now listen, I don't think Elijah really wanted to die. I think he was consumed and he was absorbing himself in self-pity. You say, well, the Bible says he wanted to die. I, I read that. But I don't think that he really truly wanted to die. And I'll tell you why. If he had wanted to really die, when Jezebel said, put a bounty on his head, we're going to kill him. All Elijah would have had to done is walk right up to her front door, knock on the door and say, here I am. If that's what he really wanted, he could have just said, hey, you don't have to look far at all. Here I am. I want to die. It's not what he did. So I don't believe that he really, in essence, wanted to die. Even though he requested to, he was having himself an old-fashioned pity party. And as a result of that, it got him down. It got him discouraged. It got him thinking these things because she could have made his wish come true. But instead, he ran a day's journey into the wilderness, feeling sorry for himself, crying the blues. Now, listen carefully. Because we have to put the pieces of this puzzle together. Moses had a people problem. He was weary. Elijah had a self-pity party. Jonah, listen carefully. Jonah had a pout problem and it developed to anger and then it developed to stubbornness. He didn't like the way God was running things. And turn with me. I want you to see this passage of Scripture of Will in Jonah chapter 4. Because all three of these men got so depressed that they said they wanted to die. In Jonah's case, I want you to look at what he said in verse number three. Look at this. He says, now, therefore, O Lord, take, I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now that's, but why did he pray that? In Jonah four, three, why did he do that? Well, in order to understand that you have to understand a little bit before that and look at verse number one. This is what got Jonah into a place of pouting, emotional depression. Look at this in verse number one. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Look at that. Anger was an emotional problem he was going through. Now, why was he angry? Well, he was angry at God because God had sent the great revival into Nineveh. The Ninevites were very wicked people. They were barbarians. And Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh to begin with because he hated these Ninevites. Yet God was telling him to go. God was telling them these people need to be reached. Jonah didn't want to do that. He, he said, no, God. He said, I'd rather you just kill me. I'd rather you just take my life. Listen, Jonah was saying, God, I know the way you work. I'm telling you why he was angry here. He was saying, Lord, if I go down there and preach, 
I know what the scripture says. The scripture says that the word will not return void. And if I go down there to preach, there is no reason to doubt. These people will open their hearts to you. These people will receive you. These people will become your children. And I don't want that, God. I do not like them. I don't like what they stand for. They don't like me. I don't like them. And God, you're asking me to go down there and preach to these people. I do not want to do it. They will open their hearts. They will let you in. And I do not want want these heathen people to be counted as righteous. But the bottom line is this. That's exactly what happened. Jonah eventually went. Jonah eventually preached. These people opened up their hearts and they received the Lord. And that greatly depressed him. He wasn't happy over that. In fact, he was angry about that. So listen carefully, depression comes at you at times when something we love and value very much is threatened or taken away from us. And Jonah was threatened. Jonah felt very weak and very vulnerable at this point. Let me say this. He he knew that when he went down to Nineveh to preach, he knew exactly what they were going to do. And Jonah did not want to give in to those folks. He didn't want to submit to them or submit to God in that realm. He just didn't want to do it. Let me say this, in your vulnerable times, and this was a place where Jonah was vulnerable, the Bible says he became very angry and dissatisfied with God. When you become in this realm of emotion, listen, when you feel like you're going to lose something, maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's an expectation of losing something, maybe in in a marriage or in, in a relationship with your children, Maybe it's with your health. You feel that you're about ready to lose something very valuable to you, very sentimental to you. And when those kind of things are threatened or actually taken away from you, it definitely poisons us with grief. And we can get despondent. And going back to the scripture that I gave you at the beginning of the message today, remember this, that unresolved grief does produce a broken spirit. Unresolved grief will produce a broken spirit. And let me say this, depression can lead to anger and frustration, and that's exactly what happened to Jonah. I believe there are a lot of angry and bitter people all around us today who are on the second stage of depression because the thing that they love and they cherish and they value the most has been threatened or compromised in some sort of way. And so I hope that you're beginning to understand a little bit about today what we're talking about in this realm of depression. I want to share this with you in light of a biblical perspective and how it can lift you up and encourage your heart, how to deal with it, how to know some of the signs of it. Again, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13, let me mention this verse of scripture once again. The Bible says, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And so listen carefully, you can look at all three of these individuals that we're talking about this morning, Moses, Elijah, and Jonah, and you can see a broken spirit. You can see what happens here. And particularly in the series, you can see their brokenness. All three prayed the same thing, God, take my life. And there may have been times in your life that you have felt so low that you didn't think you'd ever see the sun rise again. Maybe you felt like that the world was closing in in such a way you didn't know how you're going to make it financially. You didn't know how you're going to make it with your marriage. You didn't know how you're going to make it with your children. You didn't know how you were going to make it with your job. And maybe it seemed like that at one time everything was closing in on you. And maybe, just maybe, you prayed a prayer similar to this. Lord, I don't want to go on. I don't want to deal with this. Just take my life. I'd be better off in heaven than better off in this world. Maybe you've been there. Before they prayed for God to kill them, here's the thing I want us to notice today. They were all going through huge monumental physical strain and emotional stress as well. The people and the circumstances in their life had brought them to their wits end. And as Elijah put it, he said, I've had enough of it, God. And that's basically what all of them have said. Now watch this carefully because this is the way that it usually works. When you have a physical problem, it will ultimately lead you to an emotional problem. 
And when you have a physical problem and you go to an emotional problem, it ultimately will lead to a spiritual problem. Because when you get right here, you don't want to pray anymore. You get right here, you don't want to read your Bible anymore. When you get right here in the spiritual realm, you say, I've had enough. All three of these got to that place in their life. All three had come to a place where they could no longer pray in the will of God. None of these prayers that each one of these men were praying was in the will of God. Moses said, kill me. Elijah said, take my life. Jonah said, take my life. Now, none of those prayers fit in the realm of the will of God. So here's the thing that I notice in the scripture today. It wasn't that these men did not know how to pray. Truly, they did. You think about the events that took place when they were on the mountaintop, when they were totally surrendered to God, when God was blessing, when God was moving, when God was directing. You think about all of the wonderful things. Moses now, after the 10 plagues of Egypt, he's now leading these millions of Jews out of Egyptian captivity, 450 years being in bondage. And now Moses is leading these children of Israel out. He's doing everything God the Father said to do. After the 10 plagues, Moses says to Pharaoh, now have you had enough? God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh opened the doors of the palace and just let them go. Moses knew what it was like to pray in the will of God. That's exactly what happened to Elijah. He knew how to pray and Jonah knows how to pray. But here at this point, there is nothing about their prayer that is conforming to the will of God. Again, not that they did not know how to pray. They certainly did, but they could not pray right. There's a passage of scripture, and I want you to see this in James chapter 4, verse number 3. And I want to give this scripture to you. I don't think that I gave it to the media department this morning, but I want you to see this in James chapter 4, verse number 3. You know there's a place that we can get to in our life when we pray, where we're praying out of the will of God. In James chapter 4, verse 3, notice this. You ask or you pray, and you receive not. Why? Have you ever prayed? And you've prayed and you prayed and God says no, or God didn't move in the direction that you wanted him to move in. Look at this. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. That means you're not praying in the will of God. You're not praying right. Because ultimately that you may consume it upon your own lust. That's where we begin to pray outside of the will of God. And that's how these great men of the Bible began to pray outside of the will of God. Because here's the thing, you have to know this, you have to understand this, that the devil is a master strategist. And he knows exactly when to move in on our lives. He knew when to move in on Moses and Elijah and Jonah, but look at this. The devil knows exactly when to discourage us. He knows when to distract us. He knows how to afflict us. He knows when to tempt you. He knows when to send the demons your way. He's very clever. He's very wise. He's not omnipotent and he's not omniscient, but he's a whole lot wiser than you and I are. He knows exactly when to do that. And here's the thing. If the devil cannot take a person to hell because they have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, if he cannot take a person to hell, then he will do everything he possibly can to make you feel like you've been there. And he knows how to do it. He knows when to do it. He knows how often to do it. He knows where our limits are. He knows where our blind spots are. He knows where our breaking points are. He knows exactly what it will take to make you take your eyes off of Jesus. All three of these men found themselves in a time of spiritual despair. And I will tell you this, when the devil invades your prayer life, because truly, we, we all believe in the power of prayer. Yesterday, when I got that message from uh, Lynn, Sister Rose's daughter, and she said, Pastor, and she was sharing with me these personal things at first about the circumstances that Rose was facing. I'm talking about going in from Thursday into Friday, and now we were into Saturday with all of these difficulties. And I asked her yesterday morning, I said, Lynn, these, these things are pretty serious. Are these things that you want me to personally pray about or do you want me to share with the congregation and do you want all the people praying? And she said, right now, preacher, my mother needs all the prayers she can get. And I believe this with all of my heart because if you understand where she was with this leaking stent 
in her brain to begin with. And the risk that was involved in that procedure to begin with, what she experienced with that and then in the main arteries of her leg and then one in her arm. And, and I'm not going to go into all the details with that, but I will tell you this. If you got my email, you were called to a time of prayer. If you got my phone call, you were called to a time of prayer. I asked you to stop what you were doing and pray. And I believe this because in the matter of hours, this thing seemed to dramatically take another turn. I believe in the power of prayer. This is what I believe about prayer. Prayer is the greatest resource that you and I have as believers on the face of this earth. There's nothing like the power of prayer. But when the devil invades your prayer life or your will to pray, or because of your circumstances and, and you begin to pray outside of the will of God, God's not going to answer that. He's not going to bless that. But as we read in James chapter 4, verse 3, if you ask, you ask not. You receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Now, again, let me ask you to think about these three individuals that we're talking about. Moses, Elijah, and Jonah. They were prophets of God. They were mighty men of God. They were chosen of God. Great characters of the word of God. But listen today. And I want to use this even from my own perspective. As these were great mighty men of God, being in the ministry does not mean that we are going to be immune from any of these kind of problems. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be a Sunday school teacher, you can be a deacon, you can be a wonderful church member, you can be a prayer warrior, it doesn't matter who you are. We're all subjected to these kinds of difficulties. And I will tell you this, depression not only affects lost people, depression affects saved people. You've seen it in the Word of God today. But concerning the believer, listen carefully, the law of spiritual gravity works for the pulpit just as it does for the pew. Let me tell you, there are times when I can get overwhelmed with, with uh, numbers of folks. There's a time that I can get overwhelmed with uh, the emotions of it. And let me tell you, it will also affect me spiritually. That's a bad place to be in, but it does work like that. And it affects us. If you have a physical problem, it can lead to emotional issues, and then it will affect you spiritually as a believer. These individuals, they got into spiritual trouble after they were already physically and emotionally spent. I want you to see this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. Let's go back to the Old Testament. I love the way that the Word of God interacts so much with the Old Testament. I love to cross-reference these scriptures. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, I want you to see something in verse 17 and 18. Because when Moses was down, when Moses was depressed, God had to remind him of a few things. And, and just like he had to remind Elijah as well, we'll see that momentarily. But God begins to remind Moses of a few things here in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 and 18. God says this to Moses. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee. And look at this very carefully. God said, Moses, remember when thou was faint and weary? When you were wore out, when you've had enough, when you were overwhelmed, God is reminding Moses of these things. Moses, do you remember this? And then notice, and he feared not God. You see, the devil knows when we're faint. He knows when we're weak. He knows when we're weary. He knows when we're vulnerable. And that's when he begins to make his move in on our life. So understand this today, that when we're physically and emotionally worn out, we're sitting ducks for the devil. Something else I notice about these three men, and that is this. They were all three coming off of great spiritual victories. Moses had just come through the miracles of the Red Sea. And you would think after something of that magnitude, it would have lasted forever. But now we see him in the valley, and now he's wanting to die. Elijah now, we've reminded you how he was calling down the fire from heaven in chapter 18. But chapter 19, he's sitting under the juniper tree, and he wants to die. And then Jonah, right after a citywide revival, you think about this. He was preaching a revival as large, the Nineveh was as large as, as Philadelphia. And he was preaching this great revival without a sound system and preaching his heart out when he wasn't, his heart really wasn't in it. That very thing got him depressed. But let me say this, when, when even Jesus, let me use this for an example. 
Even Jesus, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, when his body was tired, when he was weak, when he was hungry, listen to this. The devil came to tempt him at that point, right after he was baptized in the river Jordan, right after the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended from heaven upon him like a dove. You have to remember this. Jesus is physically worn out. He just been fasting for 40 days and that's when the devil came. And that's when the devil will come to you and I. He knows where we're weak. He knows when we're vulnerable. He knows when we're weary, when we're tired, when we're worn out. And that's when he will come. The word of God says Jesus withstood him. Now, I want to share with you real quickly here. And I want you to write these things down. I don't want to spend a lot of time with it. But we talked a little bit this morning about the broken spirit. The broken spirit is just as bad as a broken bone. This is what you can do. And let me go over this very quickly with you. Number one, if you feel yourself overwhelmed with depression, you don't feel like yourself, you feel threatened, you cry uncontrollably, you feel like there's no hope. This is what you can do. Number one, acknowledge the reality of it. And by that, I would suggest this. If you get in that situation, make an appointment with your physician, with your doctor, and talk to them. Let them know what you're going through. Don't procrastinate that. Number two, submit your prayer life to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says this in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So number one, listen, if you feel yourself overwhelmed and you feel, listen, well, you know when you're depressed. You feel it. When you are, talk to your doctor. Dedicate, submit your prayer life to the Holy Spirit because the Bible says when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Number three, you might want to make an appointment with me. Let me pray with you. Let me help you in scripture. Number four, and this is very important. Listen carefully. Whenever you feel overwhelmed, you feel broken, you feel weary, you feel tired, don't ever make decisions when you're hurting. And this has been the golden rule of my life. When somebody comes to me and they tell me, listen, I've got to know right now, preacher, I have to know today, I've always said, well, if you don't have time to pray about it, you don't have time to get with God about it, say no. Don't ever make decisions when you're hurting. Number five, listen to this. Don't seclude yourself. As much as possible, try to be with a friend. Try to be with the people that you can surround yourself with that you know that love you. And then listen to this. Listen to good music. Good, uplifting gospel music. Right now, I'm dealing with a family that has a young son that the mother and father, they love good gospel music. The young man just can't tolerate it. Whenever the Christian music comes on the radio, it's a vehement fit. The devil knows how to work through music. Listen to this. If you get down... Put on some good gospel music, music that will uplift you, encourage you, that will inspire you. Number seven, real quick, listen, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult it may be, when you get to this place in life, I encourage you to just praise the Lord. Just speak his name, whisper Jesus. Just praise his name, give him honor, give him glory. You might even want to add some exercise to your routine. Get out and do some walking. But remember this in the long run. Healing is a process. Yes, God can look down at you and God can just with his thoughts say, be thou healed. And you can be instantaneously healed. And that's where we would all like to be in a place of our life with all of our hurts and our brokenness. We would all like to just say, God, heal me. And we would like for it to be like that. Now, God can do it. God can do it. But God doesn't oftentimes work like this. He's omnipotent. He can. Doesn't mean he always will. So remember this. The healing that you may need in your life 
is a process. Don't get impatient with God. The Bible talks about in the fullness of time, and we have to respect that. Now, this is where I want to stop here today, and we're going to talk next Sunday about how all three of these men overcame those depressing moments in their life. Don't try to hide it, suffocate it, stifle it. If this is something that you're going through in life, remember this, that it happened to great people of the Bible. It's happened to me. If it happened to great people in the Bible, believe me, it will happen to you. It's happened to me. But again, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What we have to believe is that God is still in the miracle working business. Listen, if he's the same yesterday and today and forever, whatever he has done, he can do. He still can do. Let's bow our heads in prayer.